I just want to tell you this thing about Ransom Life Local. So we have some professional chefs who want to keep, come and teach our girls culinary skills. We have a couple of artists who want to come and teach them how to sculpt or paint. A couple musicians who are like, I really want to come and teach the girls how to play guitar. We have a, um, an executive producer of a local television station who's a writer. She is teaching and working with the girls on how to journal as part of their healing process. All those activities right now, we don't have a place. Somebody here at Clarity asked me where we office. We don't. <laughs> I office out of my home, and I'm a volunteer. But our three staff members, Ceresa, Carolyn, and Wendy, they all office out of their homes. We don't have a place. Everything we do is in borrowed space. Um, a church will say, you can use this you know, Sunday school room on Tuesday mornings for whatever. We've got a business that says, you can have our conference room on Saturday afternoons. Everywhere we do things with our young ladies is borrowed. We want a place of our own. So we call it Ransom Life Local. It's a place where all those people who want to pour into the girls' lives can pour into the girls' lives. And so just to let you know that we're working really hard on having that happen, you can learn more about that on our website. So what can you do? Just get people involved. That's a group of guys. They spent a Saturday. Um, it rained. It was in the fall. Um, they barbecued pork all day Saturday and all night Saturday night. And then the next morning, that was at a church. As people came out of church, they sold them barbecue plates. They had potato salad and corn salad and, I don't know, beans and stuff. They sold um, plates for $10 each to 300 people. So they spent all that weekend. So $3,000, right? they actually raised $15,000 because what ended up happening, because they all wore these purple shirts that we have from Ransom Life, a bunch of guys um, wearing their purple shirts under their rain jackets. Um, people started saying, oh, this is for that Ransom Life thing that Susan's always talking about. I'm gonna give you $50 for my plate. One guy at some point in the morning said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in this much money and if you can match it, then it ends up being that. So all of that combined was $15,000. Those guys are probably never going to meet the girls at Ransom Life, just because we need to keep that separate. But they gave up a weekend, and um, that's what they decided to do. There's a, a woman, her name's April. She's a coach. Um, she teaches volleyball at the university level. She is taking a 40-day sabbatical from her job in April, and she's going to ride her bicycle along the I-10 corridor, which is the most human trafficked highway in the United States of America. She's going from Santa Monica, California to Jacksonville, Florida on her bike. 32 legs, 40 days. She's um, allowing people to put their logo on her jersey, each leg of, the ra of her, it's not a race, of her ride. Each leg, each 100 mile leg is gonna have a different shirt and people can buy a logo because the, April's like, what can I do for Ransom Life? And we're like, I don't know, what do you wanna do, April? And she's like, I'm gonna ride my bike for Ransom Life. I, 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 could not, I can't even ride a bike. But I think that super, she's in her 40s. This is how she's going to spend 40 days. So there's all kinds of different things you can do, just depending on if this is something you want to do. You can volunteer with us. And you know what? You, you can also volunteer and help all those other Alamo Area Coalition organizations, whether they're in labor trafficking, adult sex trafficking, whatever it is, you can go to the coalition and find a list of all of us. And if this bugs you, go pick one and help them. We need lots of help. You can follow us on social media. We don't just post stuff about Ransom Life. We're constantly putting facts and figures and new data, legislation, articles about what's going on in the world of human trafficking, not just domestic minor sex trafficking. Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who do evil or who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. So I just challenge you to be an advocate, to be a voice, to be an abolitionist. So, um, as I said, I got a chance to meet Kenneth Morris and his um, great, 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 I don't know how many greats grandfather was um, Frederick Douglass. His other great, 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 great grandfather was Booker T. Washington. And so it was kind of fun talking to Kenneth. And he um, talks a lot about the concept of how the abolition movement, he's, his whole role with he and his family's um, organization is to combat modern day slavery, modern day human trafficking. But he talks a lot about the history of the abolitionist movement in this country. And it was people gathering in living rooms and telling other people about the slavery that was going on in the United States and that it was bad. That's how the abolitionist movement really kind of took off in our country. It became much bigger than that, obviously. But it's that awareness. It's like telling other people that this is an issue so that we can all know about it. So I challenge you with that. So a couple stories, and then I'll answer questions. So um, I would just encourage you, the other thing to not do 
um, what can you do? Here's something you should not do if this bugs you. Don't be involved in it. There's a couple places that um, human trafficking touches our lives. The biggest one, Kenneth Morris says, that pornography is as interwoven into the world of commercial sex trafficking as cotton and tobacco were in this country back in the days of that kind of slavery. So if you were an abolitionist back then, you made sure that your cotton shirt was not cotton from a slave plantation. So he talks about the fact that pornography, almost all pornography involves someone who is not doing that again willingly, even an adult. Even pornographic stars will tell you that this began for them against their will, and now they see no other way. So don't participate in pornography. If human trafficking bothers you, don't participate in that segment of it. But beyond that, um, as I said, go Google slave-free chocolate. Stephanie wants me to kind of mention this. Um, some of the large manufacturers of chocolate in the United States of America have publicly stated via press release, we are completely aware of the fact that the vast majority of our cacao powder comes from Ivory Coast child slave plantations, and someday we'll do something about it. In 2010, they said they would do something. In 2005, they said they'd do something by 2006, and they didn't. In 2010, new press releases came out, and they said, we know it's a problem. We promise we're going to stop doing that by 2020. What I heard was, we're going to keep making sure that we use children on the Ivory Coast of Africa who are five to cut a little bean off of a tree with a machete. I don't think it takes 10 years to stop that. So I choose to buy, I love chocolate, but I choose my chocolate purchases differently than I did before I understood that. Don't participate. Don't buy the cotton shirt that you know is made by cotton from a slave plantation. Don't buy the chocolate that you know is made from a slave plantation. Make those kind of decisions. If you're comfortable with that, right? So people are like, oh, well, Susan, you know, maybe the brand of boots that you're wearing is from a slave thing. Fine, if you tell me this brand of boots is knowingly from slave leather, I'll, I will never buy that brand again. So just make some decisions. Like, you know, take a little bit of a step forward into the world of not participating in human trafficking. Here in the United States, those 234,000 people who aren't the kids in those numbers from UT, a lot of that's labor, most of that is labor trafficking. That's landscape companies. That's agriculture. That's nail salons. Uh, that's restaurants. There was a, a whole little chain of um, oriental restaurants in New Braunfels that EEOC shut down because it, they were enslaving people to work in those buffet oriental restaurants in New Braunfels, Texas. Um, there was a, a hair braiding salon here in Texas that was shut down because they were, um, they had brought in some women from Ethiopia, promised that they were gonna let them become citizens, they were gonna help them down that path, and they got them here. They made them work in that nail, excuse me, that hair braiding salon. Um, the women going in there to get their hair braided had no idea that these women were there by force and were not getting paid. But, you know, in retrospect, if it's costing a whole bunch less to get your nails done and your hair done than it does at most other places, then chances are those people aren't being paid a decent wage, and you ought not participate in that. So just some things I want you guys to think through about um, being willing to see what we're kind of blinded to and then take some action steps about it. So quick story about the middle school basketball game. 13-year-old um, girl, Dallas-Fort Worth area, she's straight-A student, she's involved in her community, she's involved in sports, she's doing everything right. She goes to mom and dad, she's like, can I have a tattoo? Like, no, you may not have a tattoo. She's like, but I'm doing everything right and I'm a good girl and I think I should have a tattoo. And they're like, no ma'am, you may not have a tattoo. So she, later that evening, is at a middle school sporting event. She's up in the stands, her parents have dropped her off because she's with a bunch of friends at her middle school watching a basketball game. Um, she's up in the stands and she is loudly complaining to all of her friends my parents won't let me have a tattoo, and I deserve a tattoo because I'm doing everything right. Excuse me. Um, down in front of them, there are two boys that they had seen at basketball games before. They just assumed they were older siblings of somebody on the team or somebody who goes to their school. So she's up there making sure everybody that can hear knows about how unhappy she is. She walks down to, to get a soda or go to the bathroom and get some water or something. The two boys follow her. She doesn't think of them as strangers because she's seen them before a couple times. They start talking to her, well, pretty soon, of course, they know all about the tattoo and that she wants and how mad she is. And they're like, we work at a tattoo parlor right around the corner. Look, we can just go run over there real quick, 
I'll give you a little tattoo right here under your hairline. So like at school, you can put your hair up and then everybody can see your really cool tattoo. But at home, you know, just wear your hair down. Your parents will never even know and you'll be back at the game before they come to pick you up. Come on, she's like, okay. She went with them. There was no tattoo puller and they weren't high school students. They were older men in their late 20s who dressed and acted, pretended to be high school students. They were just looking for a victim looking for somebody that they could go in traffic. They sold her to a variety of people for three weeks. They take, took her across to Oklahoma. Um, the outcry in social media and law enforcement was so big for her that after three weeks, they dumped her on the side of the road because she was too much of a risk for them. But during that time, they sold her to a variety of people and took pornographic images of her and sold them. Um, in her video, which I used, we used to share with teenagers, but now we just have so many other videos, she says, that what hurts her so deeply is that they were both arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years each in prison, which she's thankful for. But she, in her head and her heart, is sentenced to a lifetime of reliving those three weeks because she made one little tiny mistake. So how, I mean, it's just, you can't hover over your kids enough to protect them, but teaching them that story and teaching them about these dangers is how we keep them from ever falling into that abyss. So I will answer questions for you guys. Yes, sir. On um, page four of your slides, when you mentioned there's 750,000 predators on the phone um, for the kids, how do you, um, or what's your opinion on the parents who are always posting pictures of their children on the phone? So, we give a, um, a talk when I'm invited to speak to parents, and it's a little I, nuanced differently, and that we talk to them about setting the proper social media example. Um, for example, I ask parents, how many of you all, how many, let me ask you guys this, how many of you in the world of social media, if you're in social media, have had someone want to be your friend that you don't actually know? All right? can't be friends with that person, even if 17 of their friends are your friends, because what if you have 17 stupid friends? So you can't, you can't. Um, so like, you know, like, you know, like Stephanie and I can be friends on social media because I know her now, right? But if like, if one of you just sends me a thing and wants to be my friend, I don't know you. You're not gonna be, I don't know you. Um, but we, we talk exactly about that and things like not putting pictures up of your little ones and just, just setting that example. Um, and then making sure things like on your kid's cell phone that they don't have an app on their phone that doesn't allow you to turn off location. Location should be turned off on Facebook. Location should be turned off on Instagram. Location should be turned off on all those apps. And if you can't turn it off, you can't have that app, dear child of mine. So things like that. Um, according to, the, uh, to uh, my, my friend in law enforcement, 80% of what an FBI investigator does when um, it's suspected that a kid has been lured away into this world is on that child's smartphone. 80% of the investigation comes from that phone. So you've got to know your kid's password and you need to check every week to see if they haven't changed it. Because if they go off with someone and law enforcement wants that phone and you don't have the password, you're making it really hard. Law enforcement will figure it out, but you're certainly making their job easier if you, if you know the password to your kid's phone, and you should know the password to your kid's phone and have access to it at any time you want. That needs to be part of the deal. You're paying the bill, right? So the deal is I get to have your phone for an evening, and I'm going to look through everything. And you need to understand that there are ways to hide an app. Like you can have an extra Facebook account that's underneath a calculator if you're a smart kid. I don't know how to fix that. But thankfully, my husband would know how to do that if we still had a teenager in our household. So we teach a lot of that. About, but a lot of it is setting the correct example um, of what to put. Don't put on social media, mom, that you're mad at your boss. Well, it's not smart anyway. Because you're teaching your kids that it's OK to air all your stuff out there. You're saying to 750,000 people when you say, I'm mad at my boyfriend, I'm vulnerable. No, I'm vulnerable. You know what? Tell the kids at the lunchroom that you're mad at your boyfriend. Tell everybody in your, in your third period class that your mom's being a jerk, but don't tell 750,000 predators that.